Hi everyone, I'm really happy to be here. It's uh, I usually do this kind of thing on YouTube. It's kind of fun being able to see who you're talking to. Um, on the other hand, it's no fun not being able to edit out your mistakes. So, sorry if there are mistakes. Um, so, uh, there's a lot of young people in the audience, a lot of people at a decision point in their lives, I think. And I actually think everybody needs to be asking themselves this question. What is the most important problem in your field? And why aren't you working on it? And in this talk, I want to make the case that the most important problem in your field, if your field is AI, or if your field could be AI, is AI risks. So generally speaking, people focus on the short-term risks, um, which are which were touched on in the previous talk. These are the kinds of things that can happen uh, with technology that we have now or technology that we will have soon. Um, and they can be sort of uh, divided into misuse risks and accident risks. In misuse risks, you have bad actors who are trying to do bad things with AI, so they're things like lethal autonomous weapon systems, automated hacking, people creating fake news and promoting it with AI and so on. Accidents is where nobody's trying to do something bad, but it happens anyway. Things like the flash crash, where all of these algorithmic trading systems just tanked the market suddenly, and people are still trying to figure out why that happened. Um, or algorithm bias, or all, all kinds of things, uh, some of which were already covered. The thing that interests me is the long-term risks. These are the things that can happen when you have very powerful AI systems that are at or above human level across a range of domains. Um, Again, people tend to focus on misuse. What if the wrong people get extremely powerful AI systems and use them to do bad things? Um, in my opinion, I'm not so much worried about the wrong people uh, giving their goals to an artificial intelligence system and having it do bad things. These, these systems, as far as we can tell, will be very difficult to control. So really, the problem is not who's in control, but is anyone in control? So this is the problem. This is the problem which I think is the most important problem in the field. We will sooner or later build an artificial agent with general intelligence. What I'm saying here is sooner or later we will get the science fiction AI, right? Every, every current technology, every future technology is science fiction until it isn't. The question is when? What do we mean when we say sooner or later? This is kind of our best guess. Um, this is a survey of more than 300 AI experts, people who published in major conferences on AI. Um, you can see, I hope, from the, yeah, these gray lines, there's, uh, these are kind of random subsets of the thing, so you can see there's a great deal of uncertainty. But key takeaways, the point at which the probability of achieving high-level machine intelligence passes 50% is about 45 years from now. Um, and the point at which it passes 10% is about nine years from now. And actually, it's not. It's from 2016, so seven years from now, approximately. Um, as I said before, there's a lot of uncertainty here. We don't know. If you ask the question slightly differently, and the same survey did, uh, you get a number of 120 years rather than 45. Experts are very unclear. But nonetheless, we're probably talking about within our lifetimes or within our children's lifetimes, approximately. So let's go into some of these other terms. What do I mean when I say an agent? Oh, no. Well, that's no good. All right. Oh, well, agents have goals, um, and they choose actions to further those goals, is what that should say. Um, so this is, a, this is something from uh, economics, mostly. Um, the most simple thing that you can think of, this is terrible, the most simple thing you can think of as, uh, as an agent is something like a thermostat. These slides worked in practice, by the way, so I don't actually know what's happened. Um, yeah, yeah, it's trying to. So, uh, so something like a thermostat, you can imagine it as having a goal. Its goal is to keep the room at 20 degrees, and it has actions it can take, like turning on the air conditioning, turning on the heating, that kind of thing. It's extremely simple. It's not very intelligent. It's carrying out a very simple task, but it's worth thinking, you know, it's productive to think about it as an agent. Or a more sophisticated agent might be something like, this is Stockfish, it's a chess AI. It should really be uh, alpha zero now, but... So its goal is to win the chess game. 
uh, and the actions it can take, you can't see them, but it's moving pieces on the board. So uh, it will choose its actions to uh, achieve its goals. And that's really all an agent is and all an agent does. OK, we're, we're kind of gambling now. Let's see. <laughs> so when it comes down to intelligence, we were talking about there being, yeah, maybe 16 different kinds of intelligence. A lot of people have their own ideas about what intelligence means. When I'm talking about intelligence in this context, oh, not bad. Uh, <laughs> Intelligence is the thing that lets an agent choose effective actions. Um, so it's what lets it make good decisions, what lets it pick actions which are likely to achieve its goal. Uh, and finally, where it gets really interesting, I think, is what does it mean to be general? Please work, okay. Generality is the ability to behave intelligently across a wide range of domains. So something like your thermostat or your chess AI, they're very narrow. They can only tackle uh, a really specific task. A chess AI can only think about chess. Its entire world is the chess board. Its entire range of actions is moving pieces. And so even though it's more powerful than something like a thermostat, in principle, it's, you could call it more intelligent because it's more sophisticated or whatever, it couldn't do the thermostat's job. There is no position on a chessboard which corresponds to the room being a sensible temperature. There is no move on a chessboard that corresponds to turning on air conditioning. The chess AI cannot think about anything but chess because it's a narrow intelligence. And pretty much everything that we build today is narrow AI. But generality is a sliding scale. Um, if you make a program which can play, let's say, uh, Breakout, some Atari game, then that's a very narrow system. Uh, whereas, for example, DeepMind, one of their early triumphs was they built this AI system which could play dozens of different Atari games without being given any specific information about those games. It could learn each game what it needed to do to win. Uh, so that's more general. The most general intelligence that we're aware of is human beings. Uh, we are extraordinarily general systems. Uh, we can tackle a very wide range of domains, including, and this is important, brand new domains, domains for which we uh, were not prepared by evolution and could not have been prepared. You know, we can, we can drive cars, we can go to the moon and operate in a literally alien environment which none of our ancestors could experience. This is the power of general intelligence. In fact, we can drive cars on the moon. Uh, this. <laughs> This agent here is able to behave intelligently in this very strange scenario. This is the power of general intelligence. The other thing that general intelligence gives you is a broader range of options when dealing with things in the real world. If the AI is beating you at chess, you can go and unplug it because you have this uh, power of generality. The AI, the AI system can only think in terms of chess and has absolutely no defense against being unplugged. So I said I think this is the biggest problem that we currently face. Um, it doesn't look like a problem. It looks like a solution, right? If we had an agent like this, we could give it whatever goal we wanted, something like uh, you know, cure cancer or maximize the profits of my company or whatever you wanted to give it, your goal, and it would take whatever actions it needed to in the world uh, to achieve that goal, because general intelligences can pursue real-world goals using real-world actions. But um, the problem is that choosing goals is difficult. So this is an AI system that was built by OpenAI. It's playing this racing game. You can actually see uh, the, the other boats are racing. The AI is not racing. The AI has been trained on the score of the game, which you can see in the corner here. Uh, maybe I'm in the way. You get 1,000 points every time you pick up one of these turbos. And it's found that if it just goes around in a circle and crashes into everything and catches fire, <laughs> these things respawn quickly enough that this is the most effective way of collecting points. And it will just keep doing that. It's winning, right, by the objective it was given. And my point is not that OpenAI is doing something unusually stupid here. Uh, this is basically the default. This is how almost all of these types of AI systems work. Specifying an objective function which actually does what you want is a surprisingly difficult problem, and it's very common. We end up with systems like, uh, one example, they, they were building, uh, they were trying to evolve creatures that would run, that would run quickly. So they said, okay, objective function is maximize the distance that your center of mass moves in a particular time. So they simulated them for, you know, five seconds or whatever. How fast does your center of mass move? 
And what they found was that they evolved very tall, thin uh, creatures with a big mass on the top that would then fall over, and this moved the center of mass much further and much faster than anything could run. Um, or the, the, the Tetris bot, which plays reasonably well until it's just about to lose and then pauses because it loses points for losing the game, but it doesn't lose any points for just sitting on the pause screen forever. <laughs> this is the default, right? And this is the default in simple systems which are well understood. So how does this translate into the real world? This is a quote by Professor Stuart Russell. Um, anybody here studying AI or studied AI at university? No? OK. Well, he wrote the standard uh, AI textbook, so you will read his work if you study this. Um, he says, a system that's optimizing a function of n variables, where the objective depends on a subset of size k, which is less than n, will often set the remaining unconstrained variables to extreme values. If one of those unconstrained variables is something we care about, the solution may be highly undesirable. So let me kind of translate this a little bit. In these games, sometimes n is quite large. In the real world, n is effectively infinite. Um, so what does it mean to, uh, to have an objective that depends on a subset of the variables? Let's say, for example, you've got an AGI. It's in a, sort of, uh, it's in a robot. And you've decided that uh, you're giving it a nice, simple goal, achievable goal. You want it to get you a cup of coffee. And you manage to specify the goal of a cup of coffee. Uh, what a cup of coffee is, and that you want one to be on the desk in front of you. So the system goes off and tries to do that, but you've got something, you've got like a vase on a plinth. You know, a priceless, priceless Ming vase is in the way. The robot is going to knock that over and destroy it on the way to getting you the coffee because it's the most efficient way to do it. Um, and so this is a problem. Okay, before it, gets to, before it knocks over the vase, you run over, you stop it, and you modify it to say, okay, Get me a cup of coffee, but don't knock over the vase. Have you fixed the problem? Well, no. Now it's going to do something else you don't want. There will always be another thing that it does that you don't want. And the reason is all decision-making involves trade-offs. And a, a trade-off is, is just when you have uh, more than one thing you value, and you're trying to decide how much of one you're prepared to trade for how much of another. People face these constantly in decision making. I could do this a little bit faster, but it would increase the risk of me making a mistake. Or I could do this, um, I could do this better, but it would cost more. You know? I could do this for less money, but it would take longer, that kind of thing. And the AI system is making these trade-offs as well. Um, the, the set of actions which maximizes the get the coffee objective is different from the set of actions which maximizes the keep the vase safe objective. And so it has to trade these values off against one another. Going to the kitchen at all involves some small risk to the vase, so it has to make those decisions. The problem is any, any variable which is not part of the objective is effectively valued zero by the objective, which means that AI, uh, any agent, in fact, will be willing to trade arbitrarily large amounts of any of the variables that aren't in the objective for arbitrarily tiny amounts of any of the variables which are in the objective. If it could increase, if this agent could increase its chance of successfully getting you the coffee by 0.0001% by doing something terrible, destroying the whole kitchen, it will absolutely do that. Anything that is not part of the objective function is just free to be sacrificed. Um, so, f for example, uh, a line of thought might be, I don't want this vase to be knocked over. There's a human being in the environment. They move around. The human being may knock over the vase at some point. So uh, I have to definitely stop that human being from moving. Uh, and you never specified that you value being alive. It's not part of the objective function. Um, that's not like what it would do. But if it had a quick and easy and uh, reliable way of killing you, and that slightly reduced the risk of the vase being knocked over, it would take that in an instant, because it's not part of its objective function to do that. This is just how agents with objectives uh, behave. 
And the problem becomes more serious the more powerful the agent is, or the more intelligent the agent is. Because the more intelligence it has, the more able it is to um, find these trade-offs, to find new and creative ways of sacrificing things it doesn't care about to get things that it does care about. So there's a general tendency for these kinds of systems to try to do crazy extreme things. This is what's meant by setting unconstrained variables to extreme values, and highly undesirable. But actually, the problem is slightly worse than that, because in that scenario, I had, this, uh, I, I had you running over and turning it off and, and modifying it. But this isn't like a chess AI. It's not uh, limited to the possibilities on the board or whatever. Its world model contains you, it contains itself, it contains the possibility of being turned off, and it's going to evaluate that possibility the same way it evaluates everything, and conclude that if it's turned off, it can't get you the coffee, right? Situations in which it's turned off result in no coffee. That's a bad situation. That's to be avoided. So that system is not going to allow you to turn it off if it has the option to stop you. And if it doesn't have the option to stop you, then it's going to focus its attention on the part of the system that it can affect, which is your mind. And it's going to try to deceive you. It's going to perhaps avoid the vase for now because it knows that that would cause it to be turned off. But that doesn't mean that it's actually doing what you want. It's uh, like certain car companies, you remember, set up their vehicles to behave differently in the testing environment from the real environment. Um, it's that kind of situation, where you end up with a system that's incentivized to deliberately deceive you. And this turns out to be a difficult problem. This is not a solved problem. This is an area of active research. How do you create an agent with a button that turns it off where the agent doesn't try to stop you from turning it off. Some of the naive solutions, like saying, oh, you, just, you get the full reward if you're stopped, so that it's not incentivized to do that, then are sometimes incentivized to, stop, to hit their stop button themselves, because it's more efficient to do that than to do the difficult and risky task of trying to get the coffee. So um, this is a problem, and this is a problem that we can expect because of convergent instrumental goals. So self-preservation is one. That's the one we were talking about before. But what do I mean by instrumental? Oh, come on. So terminal goals are the agent's main goals. So these are things like get the coffee or don't knock over the vase, right? Terminal goals are the things that the agent wants just because it's built that way. It just wants them. Whereas instrumental goals are a means to an end. Instrumental goals are things like uh, going to the kitchen might be an instrumental goal towards getting coffee. The agent doesn't value going to the kitchen inherently, but it can see that going to the kitchen is a good way of uh, advancing its goals of getting the coffee because it knows the coffee is in the kitchen. So, um, so you can think of making a plan as a sort of a stack of instrumental goals towards your terminal goal. So some instrumental goals are convergent, which means they show up for a wide range of possible terminal goals. Self-preservation is one. You can't get the coffee if you're shut down, but you also can't cure cancer if you're shut down. You can't go to the moon. You can't maximize the profits of the company. You can't really do anything because you've been shut down. So uh, self-preservation is a convergent instrumental goal. It's an instrumental goal that we should expect to appear across a very wide range of possible agents. Goal preservation is another one. Suppose instead of... Um, Suppose you set your coffee-getting robot off, and then before it goes, you think, actually, you know what? I think I'd like tea instead. Come back here, let me change you, because I don't want coffee anymore, I want tea. Again, it's going to evaluate that exactly the same way it evaluates everything else. What's the expected outcome here? And the expected outcome does not involve getting coffee, so it's a bad outcome. So by default, agents will act to preserve their goals. And this is a problem if you have a system that's under development that you want to modify. Uh, other convergent instrumental goals I'll go through quickly. Resource acquisition, more or less whatever your goal is, you'll do better at it if you have more resources, whether that's money or energy or matter or whatever. Or in fact, computational resources. You can expect um, AI systems to try to acquire additional computational resources because self-improvement is another convergent instrumental goal. It sort of doesn't matter what goal you have, you're probably going to be more able to achieve it if you are more intelligent, if you are more powerful. And so if you are a software agent, uh, you have the option of 
uh, perhaps persuading the people who run you to put you on a more powerful computer to become more intelligent, that is a, another way of uh, advancing your goals, pretty much whatever your goals are. And of course, you don't necessarily have to ask, right? You might be able to find a way of running yourself on lots of computers without asking anyone's permission. So my point is, these behaviors are things that we expect by default. Artificial general intelligence is dangerous by default. It's so, so much easier, as far as we can tell, and this is all, of course, speculation, but as far as we can tell, it seems much, much easier to build agents that try to do crazy things that you don't want and then try and deceive you or fight you when you try to turn them off or modify them than it is to build agents which behave in a sensible way, that behave in, uh, in the kind of ways we would want them to behave. So what can we do about this? Well, this is uh, an area of active scientific research right now. It's not science fiction anymore in the sense that we are close enough to it that we can actually start doing meaningful research about how to tackle these problems. So corrigibility is one area of research. This is a property that we would like our AI systems to have. Um, corrigible systems know that they're incomplete. They know that the goal that they've been given is not the sort of true goal, the final goal, and so they don't have these convergent instrumental goals to prevent themselves from being shut down and prevent themselves from being modified. And in principle, um, corrigible agents should actually help you to debug them and modify them. There are people working on ways of uh, creating systems that behave like this, but it's an open problem. Value learning is an approach, so I've kind of laid out why you can't specify the goal up front, because even if you have a really, really good objective function, which covers the 50 most important things that humans care about, the 50 most important variables, k is still less than n. And the 51st thing that humans value is probably going to be lost forever, traded off for one of the things uh, that is in the objective function. So perhaps you can have a system which actually learns by observing humans and learns what we value. This turns out to be a difficult problem as well. It's got a lot of technical problems and some philosophical ones as well, because the naive approach is to just say, assume that humans are agents as well, and they are taking actions towards certain goals. By observing those actions, you can figure out what their goals are. But the thing is, we don't really behave rationally. We don't act in our own best interests all the time. So we don't want a system that's going to observe the way humans actually act and, uh, and try to optimize those goals. Because you know, it's going to say, well, if you don't like all of this war and poverty and stuff, why do you keep doing it? Side effect reduction or impact reduction is another one. This is agents which just generally try to limit the impact that they have on their surroundings. So rather than specifically saying, don't knock over the vase, you say, try not to change your environment too much. Um, and hopefully then you end up with systems which don't make unnecessary changes. But again, this is really difficult and uh, we don't have very good solutions for it yet. This is an area of ongoing research because it depends a lot on your, your definitions of change and your definitions of necessary. Um, it's very easy to create systems which intuitively, when you look at the design, you think, oh yeah, this will do it. But then when you actually get down to it and you analyze the behavior, you find, no, this thing is not behaving safely at all. Interpretability is another big area, and this is nice uh, because it has applications to the short-term risks as well. Um, a lot of our AI systems right now are almost impossible to interpret. We can't tell what they're thinking. So building AI systems which we can look inside and understand their decision processes is quite important um, to make sure that your system is not deceiving you or even trying to. So. Um, that's only four kind of areas of research. There are lots of them. Uh, this is a growing area of research. There's a lot of people working on it uh, in academia, at uh, universities like Berkeley and Oxford and Cambridge, uh, in industry and in organizations like DeepMind and OpenAI and uh, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, which is independent. Um, and they are all growing. Um, the thing that's really nice about working in AI safety is that everybody works together because the people who are smart, the people who are 
taking the long-term view, they see that this is not a game that has winners and losers. This is a game where either we get this right and everybody wins, or we get it wrong and everybody loses big time. So it's a, a cooperation is the key. So um, I think this is the most important problem that we're facing right now. And I think that you should consider trying to work on this problem. If you're looking for your big thing, if you're looking to save the world, this is it. It's a big problem. It's a fascinating problem. It's a hard problem with a hard deadline. And we need your help. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. So, um, Milutin has been very active on the Slido. Uh, mm. His question has been upvoted again. Uh, is the biggest risk in, uh, the theory that substantial progress in AI could someday result in human extinction? Yeah. Um, the, survey, uh, the survey I was talking about before, which is some 350 uh, AI experts publishing in the two best AI uh, conferences, most respected AI conferences, asked that exact question. And they asked about uh, what outcome they predicted. Did they predict a good outcome or a bad outcome? And the researchers were broadly optimistic. They said that we have a good chance of a good outcome, which I agree with, if we get this work done. Um, but when asked about the probability of an outcome rated extremely bad, brackets, human extinction, they gave that 5%, which is small but uh, bigger than I'd like. I would say that's one, that's one role of a D20. Uh, I, I don't trust the future of humanity to that. So yes, uh, people seem to think it's about 5% likely, and that's way too high. Let's try and get that number down. Uh, can people who are not in the IT industry but from other fields contribute in any way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we need philosophers. We really need philosophers, because it turns out that a lot of these questions really cut down to the core of extremely old questions about what it means to be human, and about axiology, and ethics, and morality. Um, if the philosophers could get that sorted, could get like a, a, a full, fully formally specified solution for all of human values and morality, on our desks by Monday. <laughs> that would be great. Uh, yeah, we definitely need philosophers. And anybody else who is able to, um, to set aside their, their assumptions and just think very, very clearly, and to not be distracted by fiction and think through the, li the actual likely consequences of things. Anyone who can just think clearly. It's, uh, it's going to be useful. Thank you very much. Hmm. Okay. So now we will uh, move on to our final break, and we will reconvene at uh, 6 p.m. when we will have our second keynote and the last lecture for today. So pe please feel free to refresh yourself up and see you at 6.